discussion that we hope to have is how do you, why reviewing peer review is important, why you should do it, and how maybe approaches to reviewing a paper. It could be drafts for the Kai Clinic, I guess, and uh, reviewing actual in, in general as a conference reviewer, maybe. So uh, I think Joel had agreed to start us off with the why and how. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so uh, we're just gonna wait for him to. Leave. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna. I have notes written up in a Evernote. Okay. Um, but I also. Need a projector. I'll do it as I talk. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I I'm happy to also share some of my own reviews so you can see oh, like in nice. action. So. Um, you may know that from some of your friends that many people are stressed out writing papers for Kai. Uh, what is Kai? Kai is a conference. Uh, it's the main conference in HCI uh, where a lot of the new stuff happens, all the cool stuff happens. Um, and the deadline is next Friday for the full papers. Um, so we're doing this paper clinic thing. Um, and part of the thing that we thought would be helpful today is to say, well, if you're not writing a paper or you're not doing research, should you participate in the paper clinic? And if so, why and how? So that's part of like the, my motivation for thinking about what we're going to talk about today. Um, but we can also extend it to, it's helpful to know what happens in the peer review process to understand what's helpful to give feedback for in the paper clinic. So I may, um, what I'll do probably is I'll, I'll make a doc after that summarizes um, our discussion and I'll drop in some examples of- And we have a recording going on. Yeah, we have a call. Oh, it's pointed right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we forgot to call you. Yeah, no, that's right. I consent. <laughs> uh, so, just to get a feel for what where you're coming from, um, so let let's pretend that I ask you to convince all the HC <coughs> master students to participate in the paper clinic. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? as a reason they should participate? What could they get out of it? Or why should they participate? Thoughts? I mean, we don't have a mic, so you'll have to speak up for me. Okay, Madeline? Um, I have, like, the first time I did it, I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then I realized that it's not just for Yeah, so you can learn how to write. Mm -hmm. What if you don't care about writing papers? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, so I can actually give, I know a lot of people here are first year HCI students who are taking the fundamentals class. Uh, one thing I talked about in that class was that, you know, anytime you're doing any aspect of HCI, whether it's writing research papers or whether you're doing designs, there's a sort of ongoing feedback and, you know, uh, improvement loop. And so, even if, let's say, you say, well, I'm not really into writing papers, this idea of getting from point A to point B by going through multiple iterations, that's exactly what you do in HCI. You need to have feedback, you need to plan in time for it, and you need to get used to it. And so, um, there might be one or two of you, for instance, sitting there thinking, okay, you know, well, fine, I need feedback on a paper because I'm a new HCIM student, but, you know, those faculty, they don't need feedback. Oh my gosh, not true. <laughs> yeah, this is laughing, right? Yeah. I mean, so I signed up, I was like one of the, I think, the first slots you did in the paper clinic, right? And so we're doing a paper on Morphic and Nicholas. We slaughtered you. I'm sorry? <laughs> and we slaughtered you, I'm joking. This is a great yeah. No, no, but it was really helpful. But okay, but that's actually not that far from the truth. I mean, Nicholas had a long list of, I think you did this wrong, I think you did this wrong, I think you did this wrong. Right? No, no, you're laughing, I'm serious. And it was, and I even emailed you and told you how much I appreciated it. Because, you know, the reality is when you get stuck in sort of, we've been working on this project for a year. It's hard to see the forest for the trees. Right? And, you know, the feedback that I got from you and from Amanda also is very, who also slaughtered us. Um, that's okay. No, no, no. That's right. Go for it. No, no. But the idea is that it was really useful. And it was actually, they picked up some of the things that we had been working on in our drafts. Right? And it was like, nope, okay, we didn't get far enough on that. Like, like I heard the things you were saying. And it was like, okay, we've been trying to do that. Clearly, we didn't succeed. We need to, you know, redo it a little bit. 
And so even senior faculty need that feedback and appreciate that feedback. Um, and you may remember, for those of you who were in the, the class, the 631, you know, I told the story that the first time I co authored a paper with Ben Schneiderman here, 27 drafts. It went through 27 drafts. And it was awesome by the end of the process. Yeah. But it, you have to leave that time and you have to be open to the feedback and figure out how do I improve that. You know, I can get feedback from everyone about how to make it better. So it ties in not only with uh, research paper writing, but also I think with just design in general. You need the feedback, you need the iterations. Yeah. I'll throw in a pitch for all the seven tenors in the room. Uh, this is also a knowledge production process. So why should anyone believe any claim you make in your paper? They shouldn't. They should be skeptical. So how do you build the appropriate evidentiary chain to make a compelling argument that you can defend? Seeing that happen live on stage is fantastic. And seeing the earlier stages is really helpful. Ooh, that's what makes me think of um, when you go into industry. I've never been in industry, but I know one thing that you you have to do is you have to advocate for things, right? And you have to tell, say, your superior, I think we should do this. How do you communicate that to that person as quickly as possible, in as short as path as possible, so they see why you think that they should do that? That's a really hard process. You may like get through the entire program without writing any papers. But if you don't know how to communicate really cleanly in a convincing manner tied to a clear evidentiary chain, you're going to have a pretty bad time in a lot of different domains. Um, so that's a good skill to have. Is, and you can kind of get that a little bit by um, you know, seeing how other people are doing it and seeing what, what am I missing when, I, when someone else is trying to convince me of something. Um, that's really useful as well. Okay. Um, while people are still thinking, like one thing I thought of especially was we are community, right? This kind of goes on with, uh, with Jonathan Point, which is um, we all need it, right? So if we don't pitch in together, everyone suffers, right? Like even if we are like super senior professors, we need it, like we need you. Um, and so if the community sort of like doesn't come together and says, ah, I don't think I have much to offer, uh, or I don't have time to do this, um, then we do less, we do worse work and everyone's worse off. Um, it's also a really fun way to just hear what other people are doing, right? That's a really like, interesting way to, let me read your draft and let me say back to you what I think you're doing and, and then you can sort of learn more about what's happening. I'll say one more thing um, from the perspective of if you're interested in like really understanding um, different parts of ATI, it's pretty good practice to go to the primary literature and say, um, you, you're going to be at the cutting edge. You'll get to see, like, um, not just reading it, but also trying to understand it enough that you can say back to the author what you think they're claiming, which, if you understand it at that level, like, say there's a system that um, is supposed to help with um, virtual reality for gardening, right? Well, what's the secret sauce in that? Like, if you were to actually use that in industry, what, what's actually going on? Like, if you say, someone made a virtual reality thing for, for gardening, you can't really use that very well. But if you say, like, the key thing that, that they're contributing is that um, this virtual reality interface helps to uh, lower the friction for collaboration. That's a bit more specific, right? And then you can use that, okay? So, understanding. So, that was kind of like a summary of, like, why people of all expertise levels should actually go for reviewing it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's obvious reasons why, uh, you know, quid pro quo and things like that, if you're writing papers, it's a lot more obvious. Yeah. I think of it's a kind of given tech situation because uh, why I think ACI is kind of interdisciplinary thing. So whenever I uh, sort of, I see a process of tackling a problem in ACI, it might help to uh, apply in my yeah. field also. Yeah. And I can also uh, look at a problem of is there from different angle, yeah. think of out of the box situation, and can yeah. also suggest some solution that is uh, very much popular in my discipline, yeah. and it can be applied in the solving of is there problems. Yeah, I'll give an example of that. I read Nicholas's paper. Uh, <laughs> look at the name of the system. It was the um, the one where you track the provenance of um, how you're making these different sense making steps. What's the name of that paper? Inside Insights? Inside Insights, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
And I got inspired by that, like this idea of like how do you track and make available to someone else. We're kind of doing that right now, uh, but in a different domain. Uh, but I was inspired by that, the idea of like how do you um, at the end package it in a way that the, the reader can progressively access the context. So you do definitely get um, different things that, so you don't just sign up to review papers that are in your area. If you review papers that are even slightly out of your area, um, you get useful things as well. Okay, so we've gotten some good momentum now. So if anything's on your mind, feel free to ask any questions or like share your thoughts because this is a discussion. No. And uh, even though we have people who are actually going to be part of like Joel, Nicholas, and Amanda who will be speaking about what they think, uh, we also want you guys to contribute to the discussion. So, yep. So, um, we have two other panelists. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, so while we're still in the why section, I don't know, do you have anything that you wanted to ask or add? Or why do it? Yeah, why do it? <laughs> oh, maybe first, like, is anyone new to the ACIL or here for the first time who, like, whoever doesn't know like, who Joel is, Nicholas, or Amanda? Oh, right. Okay. So, go ahead and please. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the ACIL. Um, my name is Carol Chan. I'm a second year assistant professor uh, in the high school, and I do research on creativity support tools. My background is cognitive science. I added HCI, and now I'm in InfoSci. Hi, I'm Amanda Zara. I'm a third year assistant professor in the high school, um, and I work primarily on aging and dementia. And my background is engineering, health informatics, and HCI. And I'm Nicholas Ampas. I'm a new full professor <laughs> in uh, the HIL. I'm the director of the HIL. I do data visualization. And I think uh, the thing that happens, I see this with my students. I remember it for myself. Uh, re critical reading and research papers is, is, is uh, or critical reading in general is a critical skill for researchers. But your exposure to this is going to change as you gain, gain in seniority. So, if you're a PhD student or master's student, you might encounter this when you're peer reviewing your colleagues or um, like in this clinic. And it took me a long time when I was a PhD student, I think it took me two years to actually start getting actual peer reviews requests where other researchers wanted me to read papers. So it takes a while because, of course, you're supposed to be an expert in order to serve as a reviewer. Uh, but it's the same skill. And now, you know, I'm, whatever, 10 plus more into my career. I have, I did a calculation a couple of years ago. I do about 85 reviews per year. That was my number, 86. And I do a lot of reviews because I like reviewing. But I, and that's also <laughs> counting not just papers I read on, you know, as, as personally, but also serving as a program committee member or editorial board member. Yeah. And the role there is different. I don't, I mean, normally there I assign re external reviewers to help me and I do more summarization and weighing rather than uh, you know, the low level reviewing. But yes, uh, even if it starts slowly, if you ever turn this into a career, you're going to be doing a lot of reviewing. It's a lot of work. It's important work because if no one does it, no one gets papers accepted. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a give and take. And um, and the same thing here, you know, the reviewing you're doing for colleagues here will help them, and of course, hopefully, they'll help review your papers. But they'll pay it forward when it's your turn. So, yeah, where do we go from here? <laughs> Any thoughts, questions? Anyone in the audience? Okay, yeah, June? I actually have a question about um, like reviewing the paper. Let's say if I read the paper, which is not in my domain. How much, like a background, I should be uh, aware of? I mean, how should be like reading about before actually I review the paper? Mm -hmm. um, because actually I'm gonna be reviewing a Dejas paper, which is gonna be in AR and gardening, yeah. I guess. But I, I mean, I know a little bit of AR, but I don't really know about gardening. So I'm just wondering. Well, I mean, sometimes it's helpful to just have someone who's an outsider who can look at this with fresh eyes and say things that everyone in the field will kind of assume, uh, take for granted, that is in between the lines but not expressed. Yeah. And especially for Kai, 
there's a risk. It's such a big event, and not everyone's going to be an expert, even if you submit it to the right subcommittee. Mm -hmm. So you may get reviewers who, who are just like you for a change of paper <coughs> that doesn't have the, the, like the specialized inf information. So being able to adapt your paper so that you can read it is actually, usually doesn't take that much. You know, it means adding some prefacing that introduces concepts and tries to make some things explicit will not cost much, but will make the paper much better. Yeah, I totally agree, right? Like, so there's kind of two answers to this as well, right? If you are a peer reviewer, like formally, then you, you should do your homework and because you are making not just judgments about the clarity of the work, but also its correctness and its novelty, right? So if you see like a bunch of these uh, review criteria, they always have something about What's the main contribution and why is this a contribution? So a contribution is not just something new. It could be crap, right? Uh, but it's also not something, uh, it's got to be new as well, right? Because if we just, um, replication is great, but at a certain point there's diminishing returns, right? So you can judge like, you know, this is not a contribution because um, we already knew that, like this has been beaten to death. So you have to know the background to judge that, right? Um, but you don't need the background to say back to them, this is what I think you're seeing, right? Um, and that's super helpful, especially in the early stages, right? Because to me, a paper is a function of not just the work that was done, but how you communicate it. And if you don't communicate it well, the reviewers aren't going to be able to evaluate it, right? They'll poke holes in like inconsequential parts of your argument, right? Um, or they just get totally confused and they don't see the significance of it, right? So it's super helpful at the early stages to do as much as possible so that a reasonably motivated reader uh, with sufficient education, um, putting in some time can get from your paper what you wanted them to get. <laughs> Which sounds very simple, but it's actually very hard. For some of these reasons, like you, you spend so much time writing this thing, and you're super close to the, the ideas, and you, make, you skip all these steps, right? Like, of course, this is something we should do. And then a the reader is like, well, I don't understand why we should do that. All right? or, um, yeah, so at a high level, like you don't really need a lot of background to do to be useful at all. Um, if you're here in the ACIL, yeah. you have enough background because that's <laughs> the community in high. It's super diverse, right? Um, we've got people who do qualitative work who don't really understand t tests. We've got people who are super good at design. Uh, we've got people who uh, build systems all day and you don't have to tell them like how a generative Bayesian model works. Uh, other people don't even know what that means. That's a big community, right? Um, so you need to be able to write to your audience, and Thai audience is this room. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I also think it can get easy, not easy, but kind of easy to write to that little group of community who cares exactly yeah. about what you care about in the way that you care about it, mm -hmm. and you can learn that trick. But I think what's really nice is when you can, and what I've been trying to do more and more late, lately is to speak to people outside. I want to speak to that group because there's really important conversations <coughs> happening, but I also want to leave something useful for people outside of that group. So people who are actually building systems, I don't want them to read my paper, uh, some of my papers, and just say, okay, well, that's nice. You know, I want them to have something they can hold on to with it. So sometimes those perspectives help us make take that paper and put it in a place where it actually can be useful for people in a completely different area, not doing gardening. Which is most people. <laughs> yeah. So I think the short answer to the question is no, you don't have to learn anything. I mean, the role of the, and it, it kind of gets at something here that seems, I, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth here, but um, it kind of gets at this thing where you're trying to find a gotcha. Oh, this, someone's done this already, so you should do it. That's not, I mean, so that's probably not what you're saying, but I just want to make sure, some people have this view of reviewing. I'm going to look for the place where I can shoot this paper down. Yeah. And it's it's not helpful when it's about peer review, and and here we want to be constructive. So what we're trying to do is, you, it's not your response. You don't have to learn all the literature. We'll trust Tejo to know that, and if he doesn't, that's you know his fault. We can't expect you to spend hours trying to get to his level. Yeah. But if you can instead try to get his contribution, make sure his argument works and has no holes in it, and everything that that Amanda and Joel have said, that's perfect. And so I would say, don't worry about the literature review. No. I tend to glaze over that anyway when I'm reviewing. I mean, I, I will look at it, but 
I, when I do it for here, I, I'm going to trust that you know your, your business, and I'll read the things that make sense. I think there's, there's also part of that that can go to trusting the system. Uh, so here, we're all inviting everyone to review everything. For if you're a program chair, if you're an associate editor, you've invited specific people for specific reasons. So they've invited you because of your expertise on this, because they already know they have someone in Amanda's community reviewing, right? So that that process of having that three to four reviewers is well structured. That people have given it a lot of careful thought. Some questions. Susan, Susan, that, that was what I was going to ask: Is does Kai actually choose the reviewers so that you've got yeah. a review team that covers the whole thing, yeah. or is it more randomly assigned? Because you don't don't review something you don't know anything yeah. about, but you can review a paper where there your expertise can be brought to bear. But yeah. think about why you were chosen to review that. You may just be the test audience. So I'm a subcommittee chair this year, and I've been part of submitting to Kai for. 11 years now, I think. My first submission was 2008. And I was not on the committee, I was a postdoc. And I know the committee was about 80 people, 90 people. It took place in Italy. My advisor, Sean O'Neill Fiquet, went down. He was part of the committee. And they said, oh, it's a big conference. They split the committee in two parts, and they had two rooms, one with 40 people each. And they talked about every single, well, they had a few papers that were auto-rejected and auto-accepted. They were not discussed, but it was not very helpful. So since, I don't know, eight plus years, or maybe more. Kai has had a subcommittee model. So every subcommittee is like a mini conference. It has about 15 to 20 program committee members. And two, two subcommittee chairs, sometimes three. And when you if you have submitted, you know that you have to pick which subcommittee to choose to submit to. That's I think one of the most important decisions you make because you want to make sure you send it to a place where there's people that have the expertise. So there's a description of the subcommittee. And there's a list of the people who are in the subcommittee. So make sure that you look. Because there didn't used to be a visualization subcommittee. So you know, we had a trouble deciding where to submit. So we would just look at the list of people and say, OK, yeah, this person is there. So that they'll probably get it, or one of those two or three people. And they'll know what to do. But if I submit it to a comp, you know, something on uh, design, for example, where I don't do, and no one will understand what I submit, then I'm going to be rejected, probably. That's my responsibility as an author. And then me, as a subcommittee chair, I will assign, I and my co-chair will assign the submissions to one of the 15 program committee members we have. They're called ACs, associate chairs. And we want to make sure we make that assignment, not randomly, but based on their expertise. And then and Kai and now they have a bidding process, which means that the, sub, the ACs, the program committee members, look at all the submissions to their subcommittee, and they say if they want, could or does not want, or maybe even is conflicted with each submission. Mm -hmm. So then we use that information to match papers to program committee members. The paper program committee members get their assignments about a week after the submission. They are responsible for accept, um, inviting one external reviewer each. So there's two, very complex here, lots of uh, information in one short time, but uh, two ACs, two program committee members per paper, they each invite one external person from their own personal network, hopefully someone with expertise. So it's all delegation, just like Wayne said. You know, yeah. We delegate. Uh, the authors give us some responsibility. We submit to your subcommittee. We take those, give them to program committee members. They give them to external program, external reviewers. And in the end, it all comes back again, and we make decisions at increasing levels. Yeah. So like the implication of choosing the right subcommittee is like, do I am I going to send it to somebody who will assemble the right team to figure out if this adds to the conversation. Um, you send it to the wrong place, then they don't, they don't, either they don't know what the contribution might be, or they don't know people, know people that they could recruit to review, and they might end up being functionally random, yeah. right? Because um, we have like, you know, people up upload their papers, and then they have some scores of similarity, like, you know, we suggest these reviewers, um, but it works a lot better if you actually like know them personally, because reviewing is, Hard work, and you have like it's better to know them personally, so you can say, "Hey." You know. So what I tend to do if I'm a program committee member or something where I'm finding external reviewers, I tend if I don't know, I will look in the reference list and look at some papers. If there's anyone there I know yeah. who is published in this area that I could think could look at it, that, that's my first go-to. If I don't, yeah. if I can't come up with a name on my own, yeah. so make sure you cite people that are. 
you know, cite everyone in, in, in the rel related topic because we, we might be asking those people. Okay, question at the back. So when you approach reading a paper for review versus consuming a paper or just reflecting, like we as students sometimes are expected to, you know, submit reading reflections where we read papers a certain way. And when you review a paper, do you approach it differently? Uh, if so, are there some strategies on how we need yeah. to change readings? Something yeah. as simple as, okay, read a paper three times. Or, <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult question, but I think it's important if we want to get into yes. it. Yeah. Wow, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'm so curious about your answers. Because I, I do, when I read a whole paper, I realize I read it as a, like a complete good piece of work, right? And I kind of accept it. I do ask the questions, but I pretty much accept it a lot more than when I'm reviewing, when I'm kind of, well, what about this, yeah, what about yeah, that? Yeah. I'm, I have a very kind of critical perspective when I'm reviewing. Yeah. Um, but I realize that doesn't really make sense because that paper could have gotten accepted by someone else and then would have become part of the body of work. So, I hmm. yeah, I have no idea. I use a template. Hmm. Um, so my process is step one. And actually, so the Kai reviewing template, uh, the you actually have to fill in uh, when you review, right? Like, what was the main contribution? Yeah, but right. it's pretty course, isn't it? It's like it's contribution and then body of the review. Yeah, it's super course. But they ask for four things. Yeah. Significance, originality, related work, and lost for last month. Yeah, validation. I don't, I don't validation. know either. Validation. Yeah, yeah. But even that, that first course breakdown is instructive, right? What's the first thing you need to do? Figure out what the author is trying to do. What was the claimed contribution, right? That's always the first order of business. So you do a read-through, try your best to identify, okay, what was the, what's the argument they're making? What's the main contribution? You map that out. You can visually do it like Susan does. Uh, you can write it out. Uh, I write it out because I'll say that back in the review. Because if I got it wrong, then the, uh, the authors can say, well, that's feedback for them, right? They're like, wait, I wasn't trying to claim that, right? That's very helpful. So you say back to them what you think the argument is. Then what I do is I try to find what are the critical steps in the argument, right? So if they claim that, for example, I can use like example from um, experimental psychology, right? Like, if they claim that X affects Y, but I see an experiment that they didn't control for Z that might actually affect Y, then they cannot claim that X affects Y in the way that they want to. So I'll point that out, right? But, um, so that's the second step. And then I focus on those things in my review. And then I do a last pass where I say, okay, um, kind of like, I think this is the argument I got from what you're saying but I don't think you need to be making that argument. Or this is what I actually think, if I'm like really expert in the domain, I can say, I think the real significance of your work is X. And I can say, this is how you should do it. But you should always be careful with that, right? Because it's, it's not your paper, right? Um, the, the most important thing is to try to identify what they were trying to claim, and then trying to figure out if you can trust it. Now, that's for peer reviewing. For paper clinics, even the first step is useful enough. <coughs> you just say, like, Yo, I read this thing, this is what I got out of it. Does that match what you wanted me to get out of it? Usually no. I would, in my experience, like first five-ish drafts is like all over the place, right? I'll show it to somebody and they're like, I think you're trying to say this. I'm like, nope, <laughs> that's not what I was trying to say. And then you kind of iterate on that, right? And that's super, super helpful, right? So even like um, this point about asking questions where you're confused, right? So you map out the argument and say, I think you're trying to say this and I think you're basing on this, but I think there's a missing step, right? Um, so that's very helpful. So I follow this kind of template. Um, I keep my reviews in the folder with text files and I have like headings, because um, it helps me. But people have different strategies. I would agree with what you're saying, Pramod, because I think also with what you're saying, Amanda, is that I have different hands on when I'm reviewing a paper compared to when I'm summarizing a paper mm -hmm. for, in a literature review, which happens, I mean, I was doing it last night. Yeah. So it was, I, and, and sometimes, you know, when you write a literature review, some, if it's work that's very, very close to what you're doing, you're, you're going to spend a paragraph describing and say why yours is different. But if it's work that's just incidentally related, mm -hmm. you might spend a clause, mm -hmm. like four words. So you have to summarize that full research paper into four words. So that means an entirely different way of reading papers. So, you know, it's about getting, it's like the increasing levels of detail. Just three words, four words that describe it, down to critical reading at a review level, which is entirely different. So, yeah, this is, these are all skills, different types of reading that, that researchers have to develop. 
Should I tell you two tricks I have for reviewing? Yes. So one I found super useful is I don't try and read the paper and review on the same day or within the same couple of hours. I print it out, I write all over it, I just read it and, and make messy notes, and then I come back to it. And I find if I do that, it takes it's so much shorter to synthesize the thing. Somehow my mind is stewing, I guess, which hasn't worked in any other area it's supposed to. Oh, it works, right. Yeah, apparently everyone's like, oh, if you leave it, it doesn't work. But it works yeah, for reviews. Yeah, so somehow my mind really cares about working through reviews. Um, that's really helpful. And then the other thing I do, um, I think sometimes it's, it's easy to point out the problems, but it's really nice as an author to get suggestions. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you might not always know, and that's totally fine if you mm -hmm. don't know. I realize I comment a lot on framing of papers, or that's how I frame my review yeah. in terms of their framing. And a lot of time, I, I think I say, you know, this framing doesn't really make sense because of this. Um, but you know, if you just did try and use that framing instead, talk about this part, that would work much better. So I, I take their concepts and I say like, which are working well together, which aren't in some directions. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure some are like, why are you? I don't want this. But I think yeah. for some, I'm sure it is helpful. I have sort of like an edge case question regarding also like giving back suggestions or like um, potential like ways they might get around a problem. Um, what do you do if you like um, see a paper resubmitted and they like misunderstand what you say or like how, oh like a like a revise and resubmit? Yeah, or like you see it at a different venue and basically the same paper yeah, except with yeah. maybe a, a minor change or something uh, like that where they seem to have misinterpreted your suggestion. <laughs> Well, what do you think we should do? Uh, well, I, I usually try to reframe what I said mm -hmm. um, and also restate um, differently what I think they are trying to say. Yeah. Do you mean that you got it to review again? That you're yeah. lucky then? So that if they didn't get accepted past you and you see your comments were not addressed, <coughs> that's worse. But you're saying you got it again and they hadn't addressed your or misunderstood your comments. Yeah, or one of something. Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, that I've seen this paper before. I do that. This is yeah. still anonymous. I've seen this yeah. before, and you haven't done this. That's a disappointing. Or if they misunderstood, you could say that. Okay. But, yeah. you know, that's, that's what I would do. Or if you don't feel comfortable disclosing that you've seen it, you can write it in the confidential part of the mm -hmm. review. And then the program committee member or, or associate editor will see that and communicate it to the, the uh, authors instead. Yeah, I would just give it back to you because you like it. Yeah, but... I mean, it is, I mean, especially if you've done lots of work, gave lots of feedback, and then they just ignore you and try to resubmit it somewhere else and you get it again, that is cause for rejection. Yeah. yeah. If they just yeah. dismiss all the work I put in it. I mean, it's even happened for me. There's a paper, I gave lots of, I accepted the paper, I gave lots and lots of feedback of spelling, because I was a grad student and I did that then. <laughs> and, and the paper appeared and they hadn't changed anything. So that really pissed me off, and those people are still on my blacklist. Even if I've never, told them, I've never told them, but I still, I'm still upset that they wouldn't listen to simple things. Instead, just arrogantly submitted their version as a camera ready. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, maybe suggestion. Um, when I first started to review and it was, I was in the masters, um, I have very little, you know, idea what a Kai paper looks like. What are the different parts in it? What you are trying to get out of each section, you know, that like you have introduction, related work, you have findings, you have this, you have sometimes designs, implications. So when somebody kind of like gave me an overview of each one of them, then I was like, okay, now I know what I should be looking for. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, you know, it would be easier for, you know, for us to talk about it. We write this part and what we try to do is, you know, like, for example, with the methodology, we're trying to, you know, convince the people why we use the methods we use, why, like, they would try and go, like, like mm -hmm. is the study really rigorous? You know, like, so for for all of us, and maybe the ones that haven't done a review, to have more idea, like, what am I looking for? Mm -hmm. So, you know, because it's easy when you don't know just to point, like, the bad things. But, you know, since we're giving constructive, you know, criticism, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I would put that under advanced strategies, I think. Uh, so you don't have to do that even for the Kai Paper Clinic. Right? You don't have to do that for the Kai Paper Clinic. But okay. if you can, it's helpful. But if you don't, it's still helpful. Right? So this like genre thing is kind of what I'm picking up from you. It's like, what, is, um, what kind of evidence uh, does this community tend to need 
in order to um, judge your claims? Or um, what is a, a useful way to talk about this claim so that they understand it? And that varies by, um, by genre and by committee and by conference. And knowing that is very helpful. You can say like, you're going to submit this to Kai, and usually at Kai, they highlight at the end of the, the introduction their main contributions, and that's really helpful. And that's like useful feedback to give, like if they miss that, right? Um, but even if you don't do that, you just say like, I think your main contribution was blah, and and you totally missed it. Then the author can can work on that, right? Because their contribution was blah. Your contribution was blah. Smurf or X. Yeah. And I think you will in your classes. You'll learn, and you get further into your kind of area of study. You'll learn to read those papers and what should be expected. It's not something yeah. you could possibly know yet if yeah. you're starting out. Um, and the thing that I did is when I first started writing reviews, I was asked by someone who'd been a who was a postdoc where I was a grad student. So I wrote and I was like, is this good? Like, this is my first review. And she's like, it's great, but it's like, it, it's really short. It was like really short mm -hmm. too. It was really, really short. Yeah, yeah, so I made yeah. it longer and that helped. And now yeah. I help, like, um, if students have their first reviews, I'll look through it. Because how could you possibly know yeah. what it would look like? Just like, I mean, that's your excellent point about, yeah. like, if you don't know what's in those sections, what would your feedback even be? I mean, there are two things. I think one thing Joel mentioned was Sarah having a, a visual process for uh, something. You can do it if you want. Yeah, if you, like I, what is I find it helpful to uh, sometimes like literally map out the argument. Like okay. I write it out and I draw lines between them. Oh, okay. Was it Susan? No, Susan does that. Okay. Um, uh, Susan. Okay. Sort of two things. One is sort of the argument is here's the problem. Here's what I'm done. You know, here's uh, so just like follow the the main argument that's being made, and then the other is boxes and arrows models. So I think that this is the problem because of, and so you've got boxes with arrows that lead to this problem. Now I've solved the problem. Well, if so, you probably should have changed one of the boxes or gotten rid of one of those arrows. Yeah. Because if you haven't, then how did you solve the problem? Right. So yeah, just drawing the things out. Okay. And Ben, you had you were smiling at some point uh, during the discussion. <laughs> oh. Very thoughtful comments. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. I'll, oh, someone has a question. I, I have so, something to say about. Um, so there's like pointing out what you think is wrong, giving suggestions. So in the feedback literature, um, comments that have both are very very helpful. Comments that are only suggestions are not helpful. Comments that are only about problems are kind of helpful. So if you, so one thing that is very common to do is, as a reviewer, a uh, common mistake is to only say, I think you should do this, and you don't say why. That's actually not very helpful because you actually might be off in terms of your suggestion, but your diagnosis of the problem may be correct. Um, so you always want to at least have the problem, like I think this isn't quite working here, I could refuse. Maybe you could fix this by changing the colors in the figures so I can see them better. But maybe that's not the right solution. Maybe they just need a different figure. Or maybe they don't need a figure, right? Um, so it's very helpful to give them a place to start because they can actually use the suggestion as well to understand what the problem is. Um, but you never, you never want to give feedback without saying why you think they should do with X. Very good. Thank you. Um, I can send some papers like, that's why. That's originally why I went to grad school to study peer review, <laughs> but I did end up studying it. But there's a ton of research on this um, of how to give uh, helpful feedback. How do you handle giving uh, feedback like in over multiple iterations? Because like I find it uh, easy to just like focus on the comments that my reviewer has given me, just like address those and send them back instead of like keeping the big picture in mind. I'm pretty sure that messes with your like process, I guess. I'm, I'm not really sure about it. Yeah. Well, so, I think sometimes reviewers, like, sometimes their comments don't exactly tell you what's wrong, but it tells you that something's wrong. Okay. Um, it's not, especially if they are from a different kind of sub-discipline sub than you, right? They might say that the problem is that, um, I, yeah, they might find a particular problem, but really the problem is that you can still do it in the style that is true to your sub-sub-discipline, but you have to do it better. You have to make your points clearer and you have to hammer it out more so that even someone from somewhere else will see and be like, oh, okay, 
that this is my thing, but this is interesting and I can understand this. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes that does happen where papers you keep sending back, you keep getting reviewers, and it's because the reviewers can't necessarily articulate it. Um, which maybe you know, why can't reviewers always like articulate the real issue? Well, you, usually it's because you didn't write it well enough. Uh, that's also a combination of reviewers having a lot of things to read and not enough time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, right? You, your audience is probably a somewhat expert. Uh, one of your audiences is going to be a uh, somewhat knowledgeable expert with little time. Um, or they don't have like 15 hours to spend reading your paper, right? They probably have what? Three? Like on the order of single digits of hours. Mm -hmm. Um, so you aim for that, like if they can't get it from, from you in that, usually it's because you didn't write well enough yeah. for that. So two years ago I was an AC at Kai and I think I had 24 papers assigned to me. 12 of them as <laughs> first, so I summarized and 12 were yeah. as secondary, so I had yeah. to write the actual review. Yeah. So there's 12 papers to review for yeah. one conference. Yeah. Yeah. That gives you a sense of the... Yeah. One of the things to think about is that uh, this is actually just an asynchronous distributed conversation that you're having with the reviewer. So you say yeah. things like, how could the reviewer have missed this? Well, have you ever had a conversation with someone where they didn't understand what you were saying? Every day. Now you're just doing it asynchronously <laughs> in a lean medium. Why would you expect them to understand it? So the number of times, like, they claim I didn't, I didn't say this, but there it is on page 17 <laughs> in paragraph 3. On it. And it was like, yeah, okay, you said it, but... Yeah. They didn't get it. Yeah. The audience is always right. Yeah. They didn't get it. How do you put this in the foreground for them? Yeah. They are your test audience. Because yeah. if they didn't get it, when you present it at Kai, the audience isn't going to get it. Now, specifically, I think there's more specific answers to your question, um, where it depends, right? So if the specific comments were uh, decomposable, Right? They aren't about like the whole thing. They're like, the whole thing's great, but this one thing, this, uh, I don't really understand how you're describing this, this method section. Okay. That's like not, it's not like a, a thing that, an issue that runs through the whole argument. Then you can just focus on that through iterations probably. But if it's this kind of thing like, I don't really think the overall argument is right, or like there's multiple things, then you probably need to reread. Um, okay. But that's like one rule of thumb. Okay. Because you need the context. Yeah. So uh, I have a question for all three of you. So what if uh, reviewers give you conflicting opinions? <laughs> like how do you address that? Yeah. I mean, one uh, reviewer said it's great that you're talking about this. The yeah. other reviewer is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So how do we? Because uh, this happened. That's yeah. why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it happens I think a lot. This is, I think, actually kind of a nice situation in some ways because if a reviewer asks you to do something, you kind of often do it, right? But here you actually get to take a stand and say, like, what do I actually think is the right choice? So I'm saying that without ever having had to do this. So this is from the outside of hearing everyone complain about this. And I'm like, you, you get... best papers. <laughs> <laughs> you get to say, like, which, you know, where do I say? And then you defend it to them. You, you definitely say, R2 said to do this, so we did this. And we say, you know, R1 noted that actually, you know, this means that da-da which we acknowledge, but, you know, and then yeah. you get to you get to say why you made that decision. Yeah. And you have R2 behind you, so it's yeah. so nice. Right. Because, um, so I'll give you an example. So uh, one of the reviews, the first, so I uh, recently submitted a paper for Hick, uh, for Hicks on PDF accessibility. Mm -hmm. So the first reviewer was like, you're talking about uh, something which is not, many people are not talking about it. Yeah. Thank you for uh, doing uh, research on that. But another reviewer was like, I have never heard of PDF accessibility until I read this paper. Uh -huh. So why do we need to care about this? So it's like yeah. address the second then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Definitely yeah. address the second really in that case. case of yeah. Who's wrong. Yeah. I mean, the question is really one of waiting, right? In a sense, right? Wait, waiting, like how yeah, do you yeah, yeah. how do you wait? Yeah. Mind, right? So like the easiest case is where you got co common points of a, uh, feedback from multiple mm -hmm. reviewers. Then those are things you definitely need to work on, right? Mm -hmm. But what do you do when like only this reviewer um, brings up this thing? Well, okay, who is that reviewer? What 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 kind of weight should you give to that comment? Say that person is an outsider, is not familiar with PDF accessibility, and many of the people you're trying to talk to um, in in that community are probably similar. Then you probably weight that more highly, right? Because um, you know maybe this other person knows about PDF accessibility. You don't need to convince them. But there's only three of them. 
in the in the community, then you give more weight to that comment and address it. But sometimes, like you know, like someone says, like I think I really think that you should use um, avoid using passive voice as much as you can. Yeah, sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. There's general rules of thumb. Um, but yeah, you can think about think carefully about your audience and what what your core contributions are trying to be, like the conversation that you're being a part of. Then you can use that to weight different comments. You're supposed to have a program committee member or paper share or associate editor yeah. who is supposed to look at the reviews they receive yeah. and weigh them. So yeah. hopefully that happened and they would say, I weigh that less than yeah. this thing. Yeah. In your particular case, it sounds like there's a clear answer. I mean, what's wrong, right and wrong. Yeah. If you haven't heard of PDF accessibility, that's not that's on you as a reviewer, not shouldn't yeah. affect them. And we actually had that happen for yeah. our visualization paper for accessibility, you know, for visually impaired people who want to use visualization. And one of the reviewers meant to your best, and one of the reviewers says, Yeah, this is not visualization, we should reject it. And the others liked it, and then we wrote, because we had a rebuttal thing yeah. for Eurobis, so we wrote a, a value ju argument saying, we need to look at this as a community. Yeah. And that worked. Yeah. And I think that could work too if you have that chance. Yeah, I think, yeah, and this instance is different than what I was saying when I had given my answer, where someone's like, you should be avoiding passive voice, and someone yeah. else is like, I love how you use the passive voice, and you have to decide if you get rid of it or keep it, right? Because yeah. yeah. for yours, it's like, I don't, if it's that they are trying to reject it and they're going to, they're going to do their best to reject it because they don't think your area is a valid area of study. Yeah, there's nothing you could do. But I think if yeah. someone's saying that, then you have an opportunity to convince them of how important it is. Or someone else. Yeah. To yeah. convince they are wrong. Yeah, they're yeah. never going <laughs> to okay. So I, I would listen to that person and take that. To sure. We're in the last 10 minutes, so we'll probably take a couple of questions. <clears throat> Any thoughts? Maybe Ben can pitch in with some thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I think you've got a lot of great comments. Doing reviews is part of being a professional. And uh, I, I would say the advice you got here reflects the comments about, you know, positive tone, say what you liked about the paper first, you know, yeah. let them know that you read it carefully and you really liked it or you thought the topic was interesting. Then be specific and constructive. And Joel was saying that. I mean, be constructive and saying, this is, I would accept this paper if the following changes were made. And sort of let them know what they can do. If, if it's, you know, if it's a abandon this work, well, that's <laughs> no hope there at all. I mean, you, you could say positively, like, this should be submitted somewhere else and yeah. give them a suggestion. Yeah. I think other things, the specific things, there's a lot of things from writing style to missing references or missing sources and a lot of other things. But be helpful. Be helpful. Try to help build a better paper. And... As you're doing it, you will help you think your help help yourself be a better writer for your next paper, mm -hmm. because every time you do that, you're you're evaluating. I just sent I had checked out a list of about it. I sent it to Arvind, maybe to send it around. But about there's about uh, ten papers or videos about how to write papers, mm -hmm. and Nicholas has two papers about essays about how mm -hmm. to review yeah. them. So maybe those get passed around, but it's really, and it, it, you know, it's really fun. It's part of what you have, what you, what you contribute to the community. And uh, isn't isn't yeah. there an example on your website of a particularly bad review? Oh yeah, seen? well, I mean, maybe that's a good story to tell. Thank you. I mean, when I was a graduate student, one of the early papers I wrote was about a new kind of flowcharting method, and uh, we sent it in, uh, and. It, was, it came back in, in just a few weeks uh, for the communication at ACM and said, the authors should collect all copies of this paper and burn them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's posted on my website. So if you ever want to see that, and it says it shows their naivete and because so on. Because the paper on. got accepted. The paper, the, so, the, so we, we sent it then to uh, ACM, uh, the, the programming languages. And it's become one of the most cited papers as thousands of you know, software projects. It's, you know, just this reviewer was looking at it from a formal methods point of view and this graphical visual technique for, you know, drawing, for drawing programs turned out to be usually successful for 30 years. It was sort of a, a primary force. It's sort of become less popular. But you can look up Nasi Schneiderman diagrams. As, and and that, uh, that rejection paper is something I like to tell. Don't give up as, a, as an author. Don't give up if you've gotten you know, bad reviews. Listen to the reviewers. As you said, the reviewers are right. It's, it's, you should consider what could I have done to 
Now, how should I have I written this better so I wouldn't have generated that kind of response? And, and do your best. And here's another sort of another good piece of wisdom if you get paper rejected. Papers that have been rejected and then revised and resubmitted elsewhere have higher citation counts than papers that were accepted the first time. Okay? Why is that? Probably because the papers are better. That your chance to revise it and improve it really does make a better paper. And there are really good ways, better ways, to tell a story and to write a paper. So you can improve the impact. My, I, I tell the story also. My parents were journalists, and I saw how hard it was to write. Writing is not easy for me either. And you just write, and you rewrite, and you rewrite, and you send for reviews, and you read the reviews, and you honestly work to make it better. It's great fun. Stay with it. <laughs> Plus, it's interesting to hear that Simon Cowell had a job before American Idol. What? <laughs> Simon Cowell, he's the one yeah. who does the right. horrible... Right. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> I got you. It sounded like... I got, I got you. it, but it was the job he had before. I'm saying, he, he was apparently reviewing your paper before he went <laughs> <on>. <laughs> I missed that. I got Thank it. you, Aaron. At some point, you, you have to... So go to Facebook, reviewer two must be stopped. Yeah. So where everyone posts all their complaints about the horrible reviewer that they had on their Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Keep trying. Don't give up. I even have a blog post how to handle rejection. You should look it up. With good wine, no doubt. Okay. Or beer. Yeah. Or, or beer. Whatever. Does anyone else have any closing comments? I have a closing comment. There are still some papers that you can review. <laughs> uh, so I encourage you to consider taking even an hour out of your time. What could you get out of paper in an hour and give feedback to the, the author? That will be super helpful. Um, you've got some tools now. You've got some motivation. Um, make this community vibrant. Yeah. Uh, I'll send around a spreadsheet again to Good. remind people. Thank you. Round of applause.